Hey everyone, Fox from Modelmaking.Guru here, and welcome to the third and final part of my painting guide to the Warhammer 40k Orc Wasbomb Blaster Jet, filmed for my very good friends at Goblin Gaming, your one-stop shop for all your tabletop needs. So far, I've guided you through getting down all the base colours and specialised tricks like painting checkers and masking and painting the canopy. And now all the decals are applied, it's time for my favourite step, weathering. Oh yes! So, this is where we are so far. It looks pretty good, to be honest, and you'd be fine to leave your painting here and call it done. But it's orc tech. Orcs build stuff from scrap and things they capture or find on the battlefield. So really, it's kind of missing something, that essential orkiness. It needs to look more like a junker. Let me show you some simple ways to do that. I'm starting with Wild Rider Red for this first step, because the first step is paint chipping, or rather simulating paint chipping. The secret to good weathering is to get it in the right order. Decals represent things painted on the vehicle, so they go on to clean, undamaged paint. Then that paint gets chipped away through everyday use and takes the base colour and markings with it, so your paint chipping is done after and on top of decals. Metal rusts when it's exposed after the paint is chipped away, so needs to be done as part of the chipping or after. And dirt, dust and grime sits on top of all of that because it covers everything. Look at a real junky old vehicle. Chipping is where the paint is gone and filthy, dirty dirt covers all of it. There are many ways to paint chips, but this is my preferred method, and I'll be creating three different types of chip. Distressed paint, which is not really a chip, but hey, chipped paint, and rust. Again, following the real-world order of weathering, I'm starting with distressed paint, creating areas where the dark and dirty red paint of the aircraft has been lightly damaged, but not chipped away yet, revealing lighter, cleaner patches, or where paint's been bleached by the sun. I've thinned the paint on my wet palette a tiny bit more than normal, and I'm adding tiny dots with a sharp but medium-sized brush. Now, I'm not being too neat, as I do intend on making some large patches of colour, but I want them to be made up of small, random dots. I'm trying to keep to edges where wear and tear will occur, but also areas that would either get more direct sunlight over time, or leading edges that will get battered by debris and detritus as the vehicle moves through the air. In some parts, I'll go back over a tiny patch here or there to vary the brightness, playing with the transparency of the slightly thin paint. Now, it looks a bit hinky when it's done, but it's important to keep in mind that future steps to come will reduce the contrast between the light and the dark. Next, I wanted to create the actual chipped paint chips using a pinkish colour. Fulgrim pink was a little too princessy pink for what I needed, so I added amounts of these other colours until I got the colour I liked. Now, there's no point me giving you specific amounts because your model's base colour may have a slightly different overall hue or shade to mine, and so my mix would not necessarily be right for your model. Go by eye and mix it till you hit it. I've swapped to a finer brush now, still nice and pointy, and paint still thinned a tiny bit more than just the wet palette water alone. The aim here is to simulate areas where the surface layer of red has totally chipped away and exposed clean, fresh paint underneath. Now, in reality, red paint wouldn't chip to pink, of course, and in reality would instead reveal a lighter red colour, or perhaps just a primer colour, or bare metal. But there is method to this madness, because these chips are not meant to actually be those exposed paint areas. Sort of. Stick with me, you'll see what I mean, and it'll make complete sense. Oh dear dog, what is this eldritch abomination? Don't panic, stick with me. 
The next step is to tie all this horror together and pull down the contrast between all the different reds. For this, I'm using Bloodletter Glaze. Now, this is no longer available, but you can make your own with simply some Lamian Medium and a tiny, tiny amount of any bright red acrylic paint, or an even tinier amount of bright red ink. Now, I should point out that I guarantee you that before you apply the glaze, if you've been copying me and you've got this far, you absolutely will have become totally disillusioned with your model and decided that you've ruined it and considered trashing the whole thing. You'll have gotten the panic sweats and gone to bed grumpy. I know because I do every time, every single time. And I've been doing this for 40 years. Don't panic. Chipping always looks like a biblical ass until all the other weathering goes on top. The secret is knowing that and how to use that to your advantage. You'll see. The glaze is very transparent and its entire purpose is to tint the whole surface, changing the hue and tone and colour values of whatever is underneath. Unlike a shade, which collects in and emphasises recesses, a glaze simply tints evenly everywhere. Glazes can be very powerful tools when used wisely. At this stage, I'm not trying to subdue the pant-wettingly hideous pink. That's beyond all possibility, although it does help a little. Rather, I'm trying to bring the base red and the distressed paint red together to be more cohesive. Next, I turn to Rhinox Hide. With the glaze nicely dry, it's time to do the final chipping stage, on the red parts at least, which is the rust. Remember, all tech is rusty and battered. An easy way to suggest that the exposed metal under the paint is rusted is to paint rust coloured chips. Remember the weathering order, the pink we painted was the starting point for the chips, but this colour represents the actual hole in the paint. I'm exclusively painting inside the light pink areas, leaving a thin lip of pink around the rust spot. This creates a dark rust spot, covers up most of the pink, thank the maker, and transforms that remaining pink into a tiny highlight that suggests a raised edge to the paint chip, making it more three-dimensional. I told you it would make sense. Next is Dawnstone, and this is going to be the only chipping colour I use on the black and white and grey areas. It's not strictly realistic and is in contrast to the three-step chipping on the red parts, but from experience I know that checker patterns actually look fussy and confusing and grainy with a full-on chipping scheme, but can look great and more pleasing to the eye with a simple, more cartoony scheme. And I use the same style for the grey ailerons to keep consistency as the two sections are side by side. Here I simply created a one step chip layer using the finer brush to suggest where paint had worn back a little through wear, tear and impacts, especially around leading edges and contact surfaces. Now you'll note later I don't do any chipping on the black nose cowling at all and I also did very little chipping or any other weathering on the bombs. With experience you'll learn to judge where to go full bore and where to hold back and how to combine different styles on a single model so that the overall whole looks great while still making sense visually. In this case the black looks more vastly awesome unchipped and the bombs would not be as weathered as the plane because they don't exist for a very long time. With the chips done, I set about the lighter metallics, rear engine exhausts and thrust nozzles with a couple of coats of Agrax Earthshade. This is to not only darken them a touch and give them some depth and three-dimensionality, but also to make them look oily and poorly maintained. Once this was done, I turned to the battle damage areas, starting with Vallejo Metal Colour Steel. I want to suggest that damage has exposed fresh, clean metal that hasn't yet had time to corrode and rust, so metal tones are needed, starting with dark steel painted over the dremeled areas. 
Then I went over the same areas with the lighter, brighter Vallejo metal colour Duraluminium, but not completely. I still left steel in places and in recesses. Variation is always good. Now, there's a very specific reason I'll explain later that I've done all the metallic paint coats on the model in this order so far. So if you are painting along with me, it's very important that you follow my process. Once all this was done, the model was given a matte varnish coat to protect the paintwork. Now for the real fun. Time for an enamel gunk wash. Oh yes. You'll need an enamel streaking grime. I'm using Ammo by Mig streaking grime for interiors. Some thinners, enamel or oil paint thinners or mineral spirits will be fine. And a billion T12T cotton buds. Literally all the cotton buds in the world, you will use them all. All of them. All. All. Of them. All of them. First, I shake the living crap out of the grime and brush it directly from the bottle onto the model. I'm putting it on the painted areas only, not on the metallic bits. I've gone for this specific grime as it has a slightly rusty brown tone. Once it's had a few minutes to dry slightly, it's time to dive in and get scrubby. I'm simply rubbing away the paint where I don't want it to be. How much you gently wipe away is a very personal choice. You're trying to simulate gunk, grime and general schmutz that's built up with use over time, so you can make it as clean or as filthy as you like. I went for a halfway amount, keeping it darker towards the panel lines and edges of panels and cleaner in the centres. You can leave it to dry for longer if you wish, and this will leave more of the paint behind when you rub it. You could do this step with oil paints instead. The advantage of oils and enamels is that they take a long time to dry and can be worked like this. Do not do this with acrylics. They dry in minutes and cannot be wiped away. If you find a stubborn spot, a touch of the thinner can loosen it up. With that done, the model now looks more grubby and muted, and most importantly, all those clashing chipping coats now blend together perfectly, and it has a real paint and metal look. Like I said, it's crucial to keep future weathering steps in your mind when chipping, so that you don't think you've screwed the pooch and throw it in the bin. Trust your Uncle Fox. The next step is to return to the metallics. Now remember I said they were all being done in a specific way? After agraxing and matte varnishing them, they're no longer shiny. Now that there'll be no more matte varnishing to do, we can shine them up again where needed. First, I'm using Brass Scorpion to paint in what I assume is a manifold on the rocket nozzles. A couple of coats gives a nice coppery finish. Next, I use Necron Compound, which is a Citadel dry paint. Dry paints are 99.9% .9 pigment and almost no carrier medium, i.e. juice, making them perfect for dry brushing, which is exactly what they're for. I use this to dry brush over all the exposed engine parts, light and dark, but only very lightly, to brighten the raised parts and add some contrast. I also use it on the battle damage areas where there's bare metal, the metal parts on the tailplane, the gun barrels, the metal panel under the landing skid, and around the edge of the black nose cone cowling, very lightly to suggest burnished metal or paint rubbed away. Then 
then I go in with Viejo Metal Colour Steel on the dark part of the engine, again dry brushing, but this time not so much trying to hit the edges and pick out details, but using a more circular motion to deposit paint on the flatter surfaces to hopefully create a, a lighter, specular highlight area. I also applied a little to the gun barrels. I did the same on the lighter rear of the engine using Vallejo Metal Colour Pale Burnt Metal, which is a much lighter colour. With this paint on the gun barrels, it was applied dry brushed as an edge highlight, because they need to remain a dark colour. Lastly, using a much smaller brush, Gehenna's Gold was dry brushed carefully onto the coppery manifold on the engine and the similar parts on the exhausts. Now these metallics bring back the bling to the metal parts without making them look too clean and all the multiple steps combined over the last two episodes create a full, rich, complex and deep range of metal shades with no real skill required. Stopping at silver and a black wash or leaving metallics matte varnished is never the right answer. Next, it was time to black out the recesses in the exhaust grills and all the little vent holes in the gun barrels. And the quickest and easiest and blackest way to do that is with matte India ink. Inks are a billion times more intensely pigmented than paints, a billion times finer, and in the case of black, a billion times more opaque. There may be some hyperbole in there. Anyway, rather than mess about with multiple coats of Abaddon black, one coat of India ink blacks out these recesses easily. Then I popped out Jacaro Orange to give the rusty parts a little blip of an orangey dry brush, just to give them that little touch of bright, fresh corrosion. New rust equals bright, old rust equals dark. When suddenly... The master of all paints, the paint of paints, the god emperor of paint kind. Starship filth, an oil paint of no equal, a perfect universal weathering paint for smoke, soot, charring and grime effects. I use the filth, unthinned, to add some heavy interior scorching and streaking to the insides of the rocket nozzles and engine as a sort of heavy dry brush and also to apply it as a regular dry brush to create soot staining on the outsides of the rocket nozzles and engine goose feathers. To add scorching to the battle damage and a bit of heat staining to the tips of gun barrels. I use this rather than an acrylic paint because it's the perfect colour for it and because with oil paints taking a long time to dry, this dry brush layer will take maybe 24 hours to dry, you can achieve exquisite soft fades and blends that you can't get with acrylics. With all that done, this completes the entire paint job for the Dakajet, more or less. But wait, we're not finished just yet. We have a flyer stand to sort out. Now, although I can appreciate an exquisite complex base, I myself prefer to keep my bases simple so that the viewer's attention is rightly drawn to the model and not to the base. I've seen enough builds where the base outshines the model attached to it, and that doesn't seem right outside of an actual diorama. So, firstly, I masked off the clear stalk with tape to keep it safe from paints and matte varnishes and plonked some old random spare things from the Griebel's box on the base, adding some battle damage to them. After a primer coat of Citadel Abaddon Black Rattle Cam Primer, I carelessly slapped on some Rhinox hide to the base part, not worrying about the scenery. I'll explain why in a minute. Then I took some XV88, Tau Light Ochre, Scrag Brown and Jacaro Orange and carelessly, randomly stippled the scenery with a big old stiff bristle brush. I wanted to make the parts look heavily rusted and chose slightly different colours to the rusty parts on the Dakajet Jet to keep them distinct.
Now, here's my super secret squirrel secret sauce. Fuegan Orange Shade. It's a standard shade like any other, but it adds a mighty fierce orange tint to anything. And when applied to things painted to look rusty, it makes them look really rusty. The Agrax Earth Shade was used a tiny bit to add some slightly darker patches. With that done, a ghrelin earth was added to the base. This is a super fun crackle paint, and the reason we painted the base brown at the start, it'll crack up and create a dried lake bed effect. So it's better if any gaps look brown and not black. This was slapped on thick and took about four hours to fully cure. When that was dried, I covered up and tidied any gaps with Steel Legion Drab, an almost perfect match for a ghrelin earth, and dry brushed up along the sides and edges of the scenery to make the objects look like they had weight and were embedded into the ground, and not just sitting miraculously on it. That was followed by a quick and gentle dry brush of Zandri Dust to give the texture paint some depth and variation and to give the debris a dusty, abandoned look and to tie them into the landscape even more. The final step was to super glue some tiny helpless creatures to the base to look like little grassy things and give it a coat of Humbrol 49 matte acrylic rattle can varnish. And then the spinny thing came out, and that can mean only one thing. Build complete, oh yes. Yes, everything done and dusted. An utterly fun project from start to finish. Apart from the bit with the pink chipping when I thought I'd borfed it, but never mind. Although I've built a number of Orc vehicles, this is the first one I've actually had chance to paint and it was so much fun, if not just for the fact that Orcs are just big dumb idiots and the comic relief of 40k and you can see it in the designs. I can strongly recommend this kit to anyone, even if you don't play 40k, because being Orky, it allows you to really get a bit silly with your weathering. Anywho, that's going to do it for this series. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to visit goblingaming.co.uk, link in the description below, to pick up this kit or anything else you need for your tabletop habit. Remember, most Games Workshop items are 20% off RRP, so come and get more for less. You know it makes sense. Adios amoebas!